Hello and welcome to a new episode of TGI RabbitMQ. My name is Gerhard, and in today's episode, we get started with RabbitMQ on Kubernetes. This is targeted at beginners, where we look at the simplest possible way of getting started. We choose all the defaults and we just go with the simplest possible deployment. We will set up a managed Kubernetes cluster with one command and then we'll deploy RabbitMQ in less than one minute. Now remember, this is not just a managed Kubernetes, it's also a managed RabbitMQ in the sense that it will automatically get restarted if it fails or if it crashes, it has the liveness checks, it has a bunch of things which, out of the box, it's pretty advanced. Next, we will make it public, we'll give it a public IP address, and we will give it a persistent volume so that data, the persistent data, will survive a node restart. Lastly, we'll see how fast this default deployment is and how much it's going to cost us. As you can see in the top half of this video, I am in the RabbitMQ TGIR repository, Season 1, Episode 5. As you already know, all the commands for every single episode that I'm running are versioned in this repository. This is a good way to follow along and focus on the process rather than what it actually goes into making it happen. The command that I'm running here is make Kubernetes, because my M is alias to make, and all I'm setting up is a default Kubernetes cluster on DigitalOcean. This only configuration which I've done, I've selected a different region. I made this cluster to be auto-upgradable, which means it's a managed Kubernetes cluster, and I've defined my maintenance window. You can see that it took me six minutes and 30 seconds to stand up this cluster. That's pretty good. You may be wondering at this point, why Kubernetes? And why DigitalOcean? Well, I can answer the second question. And now that we know why DigitalOcean, let's take a look at why Kubernetes. In the same repository, we have a bunch of other targets. The one that I'm going to run now is make VMs. I want to see all the VMs that are running here. So it took me one command and six minutes and 30 seconds later, I have three VMs spun up. All the defaults, you may want to adjust this uh, going forward, but this is good enough for now. And now that I've spun up these VMs, it's really simple to provision RabbitMQ. But before we do that, let's take a look at something else. I would like to point out this command, make canines. Canines is a terminal UI for Kubernetes, which makes it really easy to interact with Kubernetes and get an understanding of what is happening in the cluster. It's one of my favorites, not far off uh, TIG, which is an NCurses interface for Git. What does TIG look like? It looks like this. And that allows me to very quickly navigate through a Git repository to do all sorts of commands, very, very helpful. If you haven't seen TIG, it's a cool one to take a look at. But we're not talking TIG now, we are talking make canines. If you don't have it installed, it will install it if you're on a Mac, otherwise you will need to install it manually. If you're on Linux or Windows or another operating system. On a Mac, it's just pre install So canines, if I take a look at what it looks like, this is the view into my Kubernetes cluster that I have just deployed. And this is automatically integrated with the kube config and everything else. It's a really easy way of getting started. You can see that this is the pod view here at the bottom and also pods. And I'm in the default namespace. There is zero pods in the default namespace. This is where we will be deploying RabbitMQ. To do that, same directory, make RabbitMQ. And let's watch how quickly this gets stood up. The container is creating. It will start by pulling down the image, and we'll take a look at that config in a minute. And 
running, 12 seconds later the image was already pulled, RabbitMQ starting, and it will take between 40 and 50 seconds for it to be stood up. You can see here, 25 seconds, 26 seconds. Just think how easy it was for me for two with two commands to stand this up. And from here, obviously we'll build on top of this in future episodes and make it you know, more robust. But just to get started, it's, I would say, fairly simple and fairly straightforward. 46 seconds, 48 seconds. Let's watch this. And there we go, 56 seconds later, just under a minute, we have our RabbitMQ node up and running, ready to serve traffic. Before we dig into this pod and see what was stood up, let's take a look at the stateful set. Let's take a look at this file to see the configuration. So V is alias for Vim in my case, Kubernetes stateful set, uh, the YAML file, that's the one I wanted to open. It's 40 lines of code to define our RabbitMQ deployment. And some of this is boilerplate. This is an interesting one. RabbitMQ 3.8.3 management. This is the currently the latest stable RabbitMQ and we have management enabled by default. This is the official RabbitMQ Docker image. We expose two ports, 15672. This is the HTTP, the management port, as well as the UI. And we also expose the NQP port, 5672. We define two probes, the liveness one, which runs the RabbitMQ diagnostics pin command so that we know when the container is ready and is live. This basically checks that the Erlang VM responds to pings. So it's a runtime for RabbitMQ. And we run this every 30 seconds. If this was to stop being successful, I think they're like, by default, they're like three attempts. And if they fail, this pod will be rescheduled and it will be restarted. The other probe that we define is the readiness probe, and this basically tells us when RabbitMQ is ready to serve requests. We do check port connectivity. When there are listeners, we know that this command will return successfully, and then we can start sending traffic to RabbitMQ. And that's it. This is what it looks like, um, a full manifest to deploy RabbitMQ as a stateful set in Kubernetes. So let's see what we got out of that manifest. Canines, we're back in canines, and I think I would like to take a look at the logs. To look at logs, L, I'll press L, and I can see the logs of the pod that I'm on. Nice. This is the RabbitMQ startup logs. They're, they're already familiar to you. I'll press home to go to the beginning, and we can confirm that we have started RabbitMQ 3.3 running on Erlang 22.3.4.1. By the way, this was only just released yesterday. And because we're using the official RabbitMQ image, when I started recording this, or when I started preparing the video, it was at 22.3.4. So it's really nice I was able to pick up the latest Erlang upgrade just by defining the RabbitMQ 383 Docker image. That was really nice. Obviously when RabbitMQ will get updated, this will also automatically trigger um, a new Docker image. So in our case, I have pinned it to 383, so the manifest says 383, but we can very easily change it in here. We can change it, for example, to 38. And then if there is a RabbitMQ upgrade, we would automatically pick it up. But I digress. We go into details that we don't need to go right now. So let's see what else we have in the logs. Um, we can see that three plugins have been started, uh, the regular boot logs, message store, so on and so forth, RabbitMQ management, that's for the UI. So let's take a look at what it looks like. Because RabbitMQ is running in a pod, we can see it here, it has a public, uh, sorry, it has an internal IP address, which is only resolvable from inside the cluster. But K9s can help us in just one command, shift F, we can port forward from our local machine into the pod. So let's do that right now. Shift F, I would like to forward local host, yes, 15672 to the RabbitMQ container port. Okay, and we have port forwarding activated. Localhost 15672, 
guest guest defaults remember and there we go we are inside of the container that was just deployed rabbitmq383 latest stable as of today and erlang 22.3.4.1 this is definitely the rabbit running inside of the container nice so what else can we do well let's see what would happen if this pod was to be killed and control d we is a shortcut to actually delete the pod but to do that before i do that let me try and define some persistent data to show how that will get lost so let's define a queue classic queue foo durable at queue there we go our queue is defined it's a durable queue so i would expect this queue to be there when the node gets restarted let's delete the pod remember our we have a stateful set and because we have a stateful set if a pod is missing, the controller will recreate it. Nice, so RabbitMQ is restarted. Now the port forwarding is not going, it, it will stop working because our RabbitMQ now has a different IP address internally. So we'll need to set up port forwarding again. We'll just give it a few more seconds for it to be running. There we go, 20 seconds later, RabbitMQ is automatically restarted. Shift F to port forward, yes, okay. And now if I go back here and I refresh, you can see that our queue was lost. And the reason why our queue was lost was because RabbitMQ did not have a persistent disk. Let's see if we can fix that. The next command we're going to run is make persistent. Give RabbitMQ and Kubernetes persistent storage. And what make persistent does, it just applies another config. And it's actually using YQ behind the scenes. That's okay. That's like another utility to merge two YAML files. And the two YAML files that we are merging is the stateful set. This is the one that we looked at earlier. And it's combining it with the stateful set volume. Before this, these two files can be combined, a persistent volume claim needs to be created. And what we do here, we basically say we want a block storage of 10 gigabytes. So this gets created first, and then we combine this file and this one so that our container, our RabbitMQ container, has a volume, claim name RabbitMQ, the one on the right-hand side that we just created, and that gets mounted into var lib RabbitMQ, which is the data directory for RabbitMQ for the Docker image. Okay, so this is as this is getting started let's take a look at pvcs to see what we have and sure enough we can see our persistent volume claim by the way i'm pressing uh, colon and then i can navigate to specific resources so we took a look at the pvc claim and the pvc claim will have a persistent volume so this is our persistent volume that gets resulted we can see that it's bound and we can see what claimed it default rabbit mq nice that's our claim so when we go back to the pod, we can see the RabbitMQ pod, and I will describe it. I'll press D for describe. And when I describe, you can see we have two mounts. Varlib RabbitMQ from RabbitMQ, that's from the volume and from the claim. And then when we go further down the page, we can see where's the successfully signed to TJR scheduled successfully attached volume. That's the one. So this basically gives us the persistent disk. And now if we go back, we'll need to, refreshing this is not going to work, that's okay. Let's escape and let's for, port forward again. And we'll fix that in a minute. Address is already in use. Okay, so let's see, port forwards, port forwards. Let's um, delete this one, control D. Delete pods, no, I want to do port forward. And yep, control D, I want to delete the port forward. Nice, go back to the pod, uh, not pod disruption budget, just pod. And this is the one that I want to port forward again. Okay, we have port forwarding set up. Now if I refresh, we can see our RabbitMQ is back up. And now our disk is 8.9 gigabytes. So that's our volume, the 10 gigabyte volume. Now let's see if we create a queue now. We'll just create foo, add queue. It's a durable queue. Does restarting the pod delete the queue? 
control D, yes, delete the pod, terminating. While this is creating, let's verify the port forwards, make sure there's no more, no more port forwards. Excellent. Let's go back to pods. Give it a few more seconds. And now it's back up. 40 seconds later, very nice. What I'm wondering, let's port forward, shift F. What I'm wondering is, is the queue still there? And it is, because of the persistent volume. Okay, so we have the persistent volume and data will, will survive node restarts, the persistent data. It would be very good if rather than doing all the port forwarding, if we could give this RabbitMQ a public IP address. So let's do just that. I'm going to close all of these and I'm going to do make public the simplest RabbitMQ in Kubernetes. Let's make it public. And all that we do, we just apply service. What is a service? You can think of it as a load balancer. And that's actually the type of this service. It's of type load balancer. And all that we're doing, we are port forwarding. We are connecting the load balancer to ports 5672 and 15672. So we're exposing both the MQP port and the management API. And we are provisioning a load balancer for that. So back in K9s, if we do uh, service, we can see our load balance that just been created and we're waiting to be signed external IP address. As soon as it's complete, we will be able to connect to our RabbitMQ, which is running inside of the Kubernetes through this load balancer, through its public IP address. And that's how simple that was. While we wait for this to happen, let's talk a little bit about how fast everything is. Okay, so we have a benchmark to run but we can't run that benchmark, and I'll show you in a minute. Actually, let's take a look at it now. Let's go to the benchmark. So to run the benchmark, we need to be able to connect to RabbitMQ. And to connect to RabbitMQ, we are using the RabbitMQ name. This, by the way, will be resolved internally inside of the Kubernetes cluster, and it gets resolved to the service. So the service, the name of the service is RabbitMQ. Everything is RabbitMQ in this case including the application, the state set, and the pods and everything. So in order for this to work, we need to have a service deployed so that data is rooted correctly inside of the Kubernetes cluster. So when we deploy, when we deploy perftest, it needs to be able to connect to RabbitMQ, and this is how it does it. So we need the service to finish provisioning, and it's still getting the IP address. That's not done yet, so we'll just give it a few more. I think it's another minute takes between two and three minutes. And then we have one producer, or two consumers, we have persistent messages, um, they are, the queues, the queues durable, so we expect um, it to survive node restarts. Um, and we run the benchmark for 60 seconds. So you wanna see how fast by default this RabbitMQ node is when we go through the service, when we write messages to disk, they're all persistent. How fast is this default setup? And sure enough, there you go. Know, there you go. Now we have our external IP. By now, let's try and connect to it. So we can do HTTP, this IP address 15672. We are going to connect to the management port. Guest, guest, all defaults, not safe ones, but they're very convenient. And let's verify it's the same one. There we go. Our foo queue is still there. The port forwarding still works because I haven't changed it. So let's refresh this. There you go. This is the port forwarding into the pod and this is the public IP into the same pod, into the same RabbitMQ node. 
So just to prove that, let's see if I create actually a queue on this side, add a new queue, let's do foo2, add queue, let's verify, there we go. Same queue was just created here, nice. So it's definitely the same node. Let's stop port forwarding now that we have a public IP address. This is much, much nicer. And by the way, if you were to resolve um, a DNS of this IP address, you can have like a fully qualified domain name and you can access your RabbitMQ like that. Again, not secure, right? It's even here, we'll improve on this, but we wanted to go with the simplest possible approach. Okay, now that we have everything set up, let's run the benchmark. Let's run this benchmark that we were looking at earlier. So make benchmark, all it does, it applies a one-off job. It's a batch job. If we go back here, we can take a look at pods again. I keep doing tabs when I shouldn't, pod. Now we can see the container being created. We'll pull it and we'll run it. Let's just observe RabbitMQ for a second. There you go, benchmark queue will be created. So let's take a look at that queue. Let's see how fast this one RabbitMQ node is. Now remember, and we can see here the nodes, our benchmark job is running on the same node as RabbitMQ. So they will be competing for CPU. And we will get into that in the next episode, how to improve on that. But looking at it, that doesn't feel too bad. We are publishing about 2000 messages per second. Now, this is significantly less than you would see if you, for example, you deployed RabbitMQ in a VM. So by default, there's a lot to improve. Um, by default, you can expect at least 10 times more. Actually, I've seen RabbitMQ nodes do even 30 times more this, and possibly even more, 30 times this year, 30 times this year. So this is significantly less throughput than we can expect if the node um, if RabbitMQ is properly configured. Okay, so we ran the benchmark. We saw what we can expect out of the default config. Remember, it's a single CPU, and the CPU in this case is shared between the Erlang VM and the JVM. Perftest is using Java and is running on the JVM. So there is, will be significant contention on the CPU side. Not only that, but we have a persistent disk, which is limited to how many IOPS you can push. Now these messages are persistent. And the networking that we have in this cluster is not great either. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, we can run the benchmark a couple of times. I'm not sure how much fun that would be, but we can run this a couple of times to see how many of these can we spin up. So I think I have four, five, six by now. And every single one is going to be one off. It's going to run for 60 seconds, every single benchmark. And we have two consumers. There'll be more um, for if we have, let's see, one, two, four, five. So we have 10. Okay, we'll have 10 consumers in total and we'll have five publishers. So let's see if running more will give us a faster throughput. And so we can see that the consuming went up to about 6,000 messages per second. So that is okay. What about publishing? Yes, we do have an improvement. We can also see that now RabbitMQ is running on this node and we have one, one perf test. This one is running on the same node, but the others are running on other on the other uh, Kubernetes node. So that will improve throughput slightly, we have a better distribution. And that's already higher than what we had before. That's not too bad. And obviously as they stop running, uh, this will start dropping. Okay, others are picking up, that's okay. That's perfect. So about, let's say about 4,000 messages per second, both in and out. That's not bad. But obviously we can improve on that significantly. Okay, now that we finished our benchmarks, um, let's clean everything up. And to do that, there's a command here that we can run, which is make clean. Make clean will delete the RabbitMQ and all the resources, the PVC, and then, then delete the Kubernetes cluster itself. So let's run make clean. 
everything is nicely deleted. We can see here the pod gets terminated. What about the PVC? This will be deleted very soon, the persistent volume plane. I think it's the PV, it's the more interesting one because this is the actual persistent volume which maps to a block storage in DigitalOcean. There you go, that's now gone. Same thing for the PVC, that now is gone as well. What about the service? Yep, the load balance is gone as well and very soon we'll lose access to Kubernetes as well. So K9s, just watch here, it will say that it's lost connection to Kubernetes. Okay, so there's no load balancer. So let's confirm that yes, we do want our cluster deleted and very soon, there we go. Kubernetes just went away. And just to verify that we will not be leaving any resources behind, make resources will show us that we have no load balances. The droplets, they're being terminated as we speak and there's no volumes either. So if you do just make VMs, this will only show us the droplets and soon enough, these will be deleted. There we go, no more droplets. So everything is clean. We got rid of everything. We won't be spending any more money unnecessarily um, and we're done. And with that, thanks for watching and we'll see you next month.